Neil actually had a very good idea, which is that there's a lot of you here, you're in what look like little chairs, it's been a long morning, and he thought you, you might like the opportunity to stand up and stretch a little bit. So we're going to lead by example here. Uh, I like to go like this to get it. Oh, yeah, that's good. That was a good. little up. Oh. Okay, good? That's good. Excellent. Neil, hi. Uh, Neil, hi. <laughs> All right, we'll wait for you to sit down and <laughs> settle down, as John Stewart used to say, and we'll get on with it. Um, Anil, congratulations on being number seven on, on the list. Um, that, that, that's tremendous. It, um, it's not lost on most people, but the, the word work is in your company's name, and the word work is in a great place to work. Would you just take a moment and tell the uninitiated what these enthusiastic people in the front row already know, just briefly, what work, what work day is? Yeah, uh, it's good to be here with you, Adam, and, and thanks uh, again to Michael and Chinway for letting us be part of this great event. Uh, Workday was started in 2005 to basically reimagine the, wor the world of work around human capital management and financial management. Uh, the two of us who started the company had been at PeopleSoft for a long time. PeopleSoft was ultimately taken over by Oracle in a hostile takeover. Dave and I were out of a job, and we thought, That's, that doesn't seem really good. Let's, 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 uh, <laughs> let, let's start something new. And we had seen some pioneering technology from Mark Benioff, and Mark's a good friend, and thought, hey, someone's going to take that cloud model and apply it to HR and finance. Might as well be us. And so we set out to start a company in 2005. We brought the values we had at PeopleSoft, which is employees number one, Customers number two, innovation, fun. We tell people, if you're not having fun, go work at Oracle. Uh, <laughs> uh, integrity, and last, profitability. That was the core values we had at the previous company. We brought them to Workday. And people always ask, why employees number one? People talk about customers being number one. Our personal belief is happy employees make for happy customers. And that has been borne out. Uh, 13 years later, we are now uh, a company over $2 billion in revenues, growing about 30% a year, customer satisfaction around 96, 97%, and uh, have about 180 of the Fortune 500 as, as Workday customers. And I think if you were to ask our customers about us, they'd say, uh, hey, they're, they're good people, they work really hard, and we, and we trust them. And I also think we've got the, you know, a great product. How, how many Workday customers in the audience? And the Workday people can't share. Great. Well, thank you for your business. <laughs> um, 180 out of the out of the Fortune 500, and, and and a lower percentage in this room. So that's a that's a you're doing pretty well, yeah, and you have a good opportunity exactly. in front of you. Um, but before we move on, though, it wasn't lost on me that the I think you I can't remember how many items there were on your list. It felt like eight or nine, and the very last one was profitability. And so I'm thinking, what do investors think about that? Yeah. Uh, well, our stock hit an all-time high today <laughs> because we're finally profitable. <laughs> it took a long you, you time. You took that uh, yeah. attention to profitability seriously. Yeah. Well, our, our view is profitability is an outcome from doing the right things and building the right culture and uh, taking care of customers. So it's really hard for it to be a, a core value, but you need it to, to be a company that lasts for, you know, for a long time. And the past 12 months, we've actually become a... Uh, a reasonably profitable company, and, and yet we're still able to spend quite a bit on innovation and on our, on our people. And actually, take a moment. I, I know that employees, not, not most employees aren't financially minded people. They're not investors. They, they, they know what the stock price means to them. For the first, from 2005 until last year, you, you weren't profitable on, on an accounting basis. And you had to, I assume, explain that to, to your people. Like, th th this isn't cause for concern, but, but and why? And what, what were you focused on, if not profitability, from that perspective? So uh, the way the cloud model works, you incur a lot of costs up front, but you get the revenue over time. So it, it was a matter of time. And, and really, the key to making the cloud business model work is happy customers. If the customers stay with you over time, you'll become a profitable business. And that's really the way we explained it to our employees. Now, importantly, during this period of time, we were not burning cash. We were relatively cash flow neutral. The last 12 months from now, we become significantly cash flow positive, And that enables us, again, to, to fund the business. But it was explained to people how the model would work over time if we did the right things. And again, it came back to having happy customers. And I assume, you know, Tim mentioned this earlier, that you were 
growing very quickly. Even if you weren't generating a lot of cash, that must have been palpable to people in the organization. Yep. Well, it's, uh, it's both a, a blessing and, a, and, and it can be a curse. Uh, we're now 8,000 people. We went public six years ago at less than 1,000 people. Uh, we've hit some bumps in the road uh, with our culture and we, and we were looking back and trying to figure out why and what we realized is half the people in the company are new in the last two years and half the managers are new in the last two years. So, you know, when, when you go through those periods of rapid growth, you need to make sure that you're, you're ready for it and that you have all the structures and, and management training in place to onboard people that rapidly. And, and every one of the companies that go through that rapid growth phase, we all, we all compare notes and say, yeah, we, I wish we had done this sooner or recognize that sooner. So let's break that down and, and drill down on that right now. It makes intuitive, intuitive sense to everybody that a smaller company can have a more cohesive culture, everybody can know what everyone else is doing, and a bigger company has a harder time with that. So talk about some of the specific ta uh, 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 tasks or, or, or actions you needed to take to get there. Well, so, so uh, you know, it actually goes back to uh, watching some of our, our ratings online, we saw our Glassdoor ratings go down. And forever, they had been very high, and all of a sudden, we saw a, a pretty serious dip. And I looked at the senior management team. It was the same senior management team for the last five years. Like, okay, it's not, it's not them. What, what's going on? And as we dug through the data and did a lot of surveys, I did, I did probably a dozen town halls, we came to the conclusion that it was this issue that half the managers in the company were new in the last two years, and if they hadn't gone through some serious management training at Workday, which they probably hadn't, they would manage how they had managed wherever they came from before. And, uh, and that was a big insight that, you know, we, we, we really need to train these managers. It was the frontline managers, and there's a great, uh, a great phrase that uh, our head of products, Petros, uses, People join companies and they leave managers. And so, uh, you know, we were seeing that where we had a, a manager that wasn't a great manager, we saw a turnover and that's not, that's not ideal. So we invested, and Greg Pryor's here, he really r led this program. We invested in a People, people uh, Leadership Summit where we took all 1,300 managers offsite for three days in two different sessions. And instead of having an outside firm, we actually had the management team teach the session on how you lead and how you manage at Workday. You manage with empathy, you manage with listening, uh, how you solve conflict. We have a very specific way of doing things in a unique culture. And our view was, if after this uh, session, managers are still struggling, then maybe they shouldn't be at Workday. Because my job as CEO is to protect the individual contributors. They do the real work. Mm. I, you know, I don't do real work. Uh, you know, I'm not sure what I do anymore other than do things like this. Uh, um, this is real work, Anil. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so the individual contributors doing the real work. They deserve a great manager. And our job, Greg and I teamed up to create this environment where we, where we invested heavily in our managers. And then we've used services like BetterUp to create mentoring and internal mentoring and all, a whole bunch of techniques to make sure that you know, going back to the days of IBM many years ago, I think that idea of management training is lost. We got, we got to bring it back. We got, we got to invest in our leaders if we want them to be great leaders in the way that we run our companies. Now, uh, let me, let me uh, pay, play devil's advocate a little bit on a couple things. One is, I'm, I'm, just, I'm really fascinated that the warning sign here was your Glassdoor rating. How many of the people in the room look at Glassdoor on a regular basis? Yeah, not, not as many as I would have thought, but, but so you, you were looking at, I, I just, about, I don't know, I looked like about 20% of, of the room raised, raised their hand. Um, it's interesting, and I, I assume this must have also been a warning sign, that it took seeing Glassdoor as opposed to listening what was going on in the hallways to, we, we, to we, figure out you had a problem. Yeah. It, it was, a, it was several, several signals. Okay. Glassdoor was one, and candidly, I first discounted Glassdoor because I'm not sure... You know, it's always a, a great representation in many cases as employees who have been let go or employees yeah. or candidates you didn't hire. People with a grievance of Gre some People kind. with a grievance of some sort. Uh, <laughs> Not sure what that applause means, either. but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> but, but, in, but, it, but it is a data set that's worth paying attention to. We're right. also paying attention to our turnover 
Okay. And what we saw was the, the long-time Workday employees were still happy and engaged. The one to two-year cohort were turning over at north of 10%, while the, the longer-term employees were in the five to 6%. We have some of the lowest turnover in, in the Valley, but still that over 10% was a data point. And then I started doing the town halls and, and got a really good sense of what was, what was going on. We, did, we used our own product to do some surveying. We have a thing called Pulse Surveys in, the, in Workday that gets a, gives you a sense of where people are and pretty quickly came to, you know, we sort of diagnosed the, the situation, triaged it, and, and so, so I would say Glassdoor was one part of the data. Got it. Now, so higher than desired turnover is a very obvious black and white business, business expense. You'd, rather, you'd yeah. rather not have that if you could. But when you saw these problems, was there any commensurate uh, blip in the company's financial performance? Uh, I wouldn't say it was commensurate in the financial performance. It was, we, we had some struggles in hiring for a period of time. Interesting. And that would have manifested itself, I think, down the road. I think financial performance is usually uh, not the leading indicator, but a, a lagging indicator. But, you know, we, we got on track and our ratings are, are back up. Employee satisfaction is as high as it's ever been. Uh, you know, we're obviously number seven on the list. I would say the most important thing about that list, though, and is, is the data that Michael and team provide us. We, mm. we deliver the data to each of our managers. All 1,300 managers got a personalized uh, package of how they're viewed in a 360-degree perspective by their peers and their employees, and it's actionable. I got one. I got a clear areas that I can, I can be better in. Tell us one. Um, for me, I need to do a better job. My, my trust was 100% with my management team. I could do a much better job communicating on a regular basis with them where we're headed as a company. And sometimes I just get an idea and start doing it, and I forget to tell people what we're, why we're doing it. Uh, and so every, that was, every leader can relate to that. Yeah, so I've, I've tried to get better at, at, at that, that one. That was the, that was the big area, was, was in, improving communications with the team. Mm -hmm. um, and another area of, of playing devil's advocate, Anil, is you know you made a you made a joke earlier that if if you don't, if you if fun is not important to you, go to work at Oracle. And um, jokes aside, they're a competitor. They were a bitter competitor for you at one point. But but the, the companies have reputations. So yeah. let's just let's just assume for a moment that that's conventional wisdom. That that's not a fun place. They're not as concerned about these metrics as as you are. It's a very successful company, yep. and by the way, a durable company that yep. has been built to last, has been around for decades, so who cares about all this touchy-feely yeah. human, right. human stuff? Anyway. It's, it's a good question. First of all, I like to uh, tease them, and I'm equally willing to be teased, and uh, I've, got a, I've got a ton of respect for Larry Ellison and what he's built at Oracle, and I do think that they have fun, not as much as us. Okay, that, 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 that's kinder. So when, when, you're, you. when you're the... <laughs> when you're the new company on the block, and, and they, they have had this great record of success, and they built great technology, when you're the new company on the block, and you're going up against these giants like SAP and Oracle, I frankly think our differentiated culture is one of the reasons why we win, right? Mm -hmm. this, we live in a world of, of zero sum. It, it's not like a greenfield. Everybody's already got an HR system or a finance system. They're choosing to leave SAP or Oracle to go to Workday. I mean, that's a, that's a distinct choice, and it's not an easy choice. And excuse me, just so everyone understands, that's because you play at the big company level. Yep. You, you could be going after 17-person companies, you're not. No, our, our, uh, our market is 1,000 employees to our biggest customers, Walmart, with 2.2 million employees. Amazon, that's a good one. Amazon, FedEx, Bank of America, really, really big companies as customers. But, but that's, our, that's our market, and so we're up against two companies. And I, and I can't tell you how many times... Uh, a CIO or a CHR will say, we, we chose Workday because we loved your people. And that, that fun, integrity, innovation, it's, it's, it can be a vicious cycle, it can be a virtuous cycle. We choose it to be a virtuous cycle. And I really think that, uh, I used to say that, you know, culture trumps strategy. Maybe that's not the right choice of words anymore. Culture eats strategy. <laughs> um, for breakfast. For breakfast. And, and I, in 10 years, I don't know what technology we'll be working on. I don't know what apps we'll have. But if we have the right culture, I, I'm confident we'll be a, a great company. So you, you, um, you alluded to the fact that you use your own technology 
to achieve these, these, these people goals. Um, tell everybody more specifically about how you use Workday, but also generally your thoughts on how technology can make a, for a better workplace. Okay. How many people in the room are HR professionals? Okay, we wow. finally got a big response to yeah, our that's to great. one of these. Yeah. So I think this is, this is a seminal moment for, for people in the HR profession. Historically, HR was a back office function. Uh, today, it's a front office function. If, if you talk to CEOs, typically the number one thing on their agenda is, their, is talent. And so when I go back to my days at PeopleSoft, HR was about payroll, it was about benefits, it was about tracking all the biographic uh, and, and uh, statutory data to be compliant. Today, that's, that, is a, that is a commodity. HR is about, uh, it's about recruiting the best people, uh, giving them the skills to be better, creating great cultures, evaluating performance, getting performance to be better. And so if you think about that, we've all collectively reimagined the world of HR. And so for Workday, that was the basis of a new system. It wasn't just about moving HR into the cloud, it was reimagining what HR does. So, uh, so we use that to drive Workday. I think the number one uh, thing that's changed in business in the last 15 years is transparency. We all recognize that moving as much information out into the hands of the employees makes for a better company, makes for more engaged employees, makes for happier employees. So Workday is ubiquitous. It's available on your iPhone, your iPad, uh, on any device. Get the information out. Number two, it's driven by the, it's driven by the talent initiative. It does HR, it does payroll, but it's all about attracting the right people, retaining them, uh, in, in, the case of, in the case of learning, we've come up with effectively a way of building a corporate YouTube where we create our own content, it's fun content, and uh, people use it to, to, to learn, right? We learn in a, in a fun, interactive way, not the old in-classroom way, but in fun video, short video snippets way. Um, and then you tie that to performance. And performance now, as, as you all know, has so many inputs and you're looking for your high, high performers. And the last way we use the system is we use machine learning to identify which high performers are, are at risk. Mm. And you can look at a whole set of criteria. At right risk of leaving. leaving. Yep. Mm -hmm. We have a, mm -hmm. a capability that, uh, in, terms of, in terms of talent predictor that we'll look at when was the last time the person was promoted, when was the last time uh, uh, the person had a, you know, how, is the, how, how good is the manager this person has, how competitive is that job outside the company? Mm. We'll come up with a score and say, hey, you know, you either need to promote this person or raise your compensation or statistically you're at risk of losing them. And, you know, so that's, that's really how we, how we drive Workday. But I'd say first and foremost, it's about getting the information in the form of analytics into the hands of the employees and then giving the managers the tools to, you know, create a great work environment. And, and that's exactly where I, want, where I want to go next. Let's flip it from the technology to the human. You have an interesting story around, um, around a, 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 a very high achieving performer who nevertheless had a problem. Uh, we've had that, you know, several times. And, uh, you know, you give them the time to figure out if they can fit in the culture and, and live to the value system. And if they can't, it's hard, but you let them go. So in a, in a sales environment, what, what, that, that sounds very difficult to me. Someone's not just making their numbers, they're beating their numbers. Their clients love them, they're getting big bonuses, they're bragging about it, and, and, uh, and you want everybody to be, you know, to have that swagger in a sales environment, and you're gonna let somebody go like that because they're not nice to the people they work with? Well, first of all, the, the bragging about it and, and you know, having a big ego, that is all good salespeople, right? So <laughs> we would have, so we'd a, have a small we, sales team. <laughs> we'd have a small sales team. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you have people in the company that have edges and you, know, all, you can do your best to coach them, but if they live by the value system of treating employees well, treating customers well, living up to integrity, you try to put them in, in places where they can be successful. If they continue to not treat employees well, it doesn't matter how good they are. And you mean that. You'll yep. really let a top performer like that go, and you yep. have. Yep. Let's shift to... Um, but, but, but I would say the flip side of that is, when you let a top performer go because of that reason, it has the 
the intended consequence of everybody says, wow, even if I'm really a top performer here, if I don't treat people well, I'm gonna be, I could be gone too. It sends a really powerful message and your other top performers do the right thing and in the industry, you attract the other like-minded people that say, hey, I wanna do well, but I wanna do it in the right way. By the way, it just occurred to me that I didn't ask, have your glass door ratings gone back up again? Mm -hmm. Um, you have, uh, you have uh, strong views on... Yeah, but I care much more about the great place to work data. Of course you do. First. Yeah, of course <laughs> you do. A, a diplomat and a, and a salesman r r rolled into one. And, and I, just, but just so, so we're on it, uh, yeah. I think the data that, that, uh, that you get from the great place, great place to work is so valuable. Michael and I are actually forging a partnership where we're gonna be able to bring that data into the Workday HR system. So for companies that are going down uh, the process of, of uh, the, you know, your, your, your list, even if they don't get on that list, they'll get data and it could be another, another set of data for performance management. And, and it sort of fills in, the, fills in the story for a manager to have, you know, to have their internal data, their, their manager's evaluation, but also have this rich data from a great place to work as, as a comparison, and I, I think it'll make for better, a better performance management process. Um, Neil, as a CEO, as a, as, a, uh, as, a, as a founder, as an entrepreneur, as a manager, you have um, opinions on diversity and inclusion, and you have a track record, so start there and tell people the composition of, of the Workday management team. Uh, the Workday management and team. And the company. And the company. Uh, I think we're about 40% women, in, in, in Workday, half the management team is, is comprised of women. Our CIO, CFO, um, CHRO, and our newly minted president, who we celebrated last night, uh, are women. So, so it's half the management team. I didn't set out to build a management team about diversity. I frankly think if you put the right value system in place, the right people rise to the top. We're a culture built on being good listeners, being empathetic, and I think the right people have emerged as leaders. The woman who became president, Robin Sisko, was our CFO. She's a rock star. She, she, she is the right person to be president, along with a gentleman named Chano Fernandez. I think if you build the right value system and, and live by your value system, uh, the, the, the thing that we do on diversity that, that you can't get around is you have to make sure that there's enough candidates coming in in the pool through the recruiting process. But if you're sure that that's the case, once they're in the company, they should have a, an, an ability to be as, as great as they can be. You know, there's a... This but, but that's, I'd say that getting the right candidates into the mix, that is the hardest part, and that's the one you have to keep reminding yourself. Look at the data on a regular basis. How many, how many people of diverse backgrounds are actually being interviewed for a particular job? And, and we, have, we have metrics and goals for that just to make sure that we're, we're interviewing a diverse group. And if we're not getting there, we proactively find places uh, to, to recruit. So we're going in a big tour of, uh, of uh, African-American universities in North Carolina and other places to, to get some of these students into the early, uh, early entry-level jobs in technology and Workday. It's, it's, so far, it's been fantastic. It's a, it's a pool of talent that very few companies are, or I shouldn't say very few, more companies should be tapping into. And so, I, I, Anil's making an important point, which is you're focused on, for the purposes of this conversation, you're focused on the front of the funnel as opposed to the end of the, as opposed to the end of the funnel. You know, this is a raging topic in the Valley. YouTube has been sued by an employee saying that they had policies that said, you, we will not hire middle-aged white, white men. Um, whether or not that's true, whether or not, you know, it's a valid accusation. Other companies, other managers have said out loud, you know, I have a job opening and I will not fill it with a, with a white man because we've, we've had enough of that. What's your take <laughs> on, on both of those strands uh, of thought? I think any time you have, you know, strong rules like that, you have unintended consequences. I come back to have the right value system, get the right people in the door, I do think with some of the, some of the uh, groups for inclusion and diversity, you do, you do have to make sure that they have the right mentoring within the company. If you're a white male coming into the company, you're gonna find mentors pretty easily. If, if you're from a different group, it might be a little bit tougher, and so the company has to be focused on that piece. But I'm a big fan of making the, making the, the pool diverse and broad. 
providing the right tools, but not having rules like that. And, you know, not having rules like that has gotten us to a company of 40% women, 10% of diverse, 10% diversity, and 50% on the management team. So I think without, without being negative, I think maybe there are many ways to get there. I, I think our way is more, is frankly more transparent and open. And people who are in the roles that they're in, they believe that they earn that role. And I think that is a key, a key takeaway. You, you really need to feel like you earn that role. And everybody at Workday who's in a senior role, they know they earned that role. I was going to say, not only do they believe they earned that role, but you believe yeah. they earned that role too because you didn't choose them because it would help with diversity. That's what you're, I want to be clear, but that's what Absolutely. you're saying. Absolutely. Now, over time, I, I've definitely seen the value of diversity and having a management team that is, uh, that is diverse. Uh, I think we've got one of the most functional management teams in our industry and very little turnover, uh, almost no turnover in the last 15 years in the management team. People will we'll come in and they'll go into senior roles and as, as they uh, fade away, they still stay on as advisors. Hmm. But as we've gone through that, those changes, it's, it's an incredibly well-functioning senior management team. So it works and so now my job is to protect that. Now I do want to protect it, right? I want to protect that, that I feel like we've found a little bit of magic and I want to protect that magic. Very last thing, as given what, you, given what Workday does, you have a unique perspective into your customer, so you spend a lot of time with, because it's, a, it's an important relationship. T tell us about one or, one or two, and, and, and some, some of the journeys that they're on that you're participating in. Well, so, so uh, it's, it's really, it's really a, a fascinating time to be in the world of, of HR, because you know, 20 years ago, CEOs really didn't care about this, and, and today, Almost every time we're, you know, we're going through a, a sales cycle, I am at some point or another meeting with the CEO, and they're talking about their agenda around people, around, uh, around embracing, engaging, uh, empowering their people. Where is my talent? Where's my next generation of talent? They all, they've all understood it. They've all drank, drank, I don't want to call it the Kool-Aid because it's the right thing, and I think that's the great opportunity for all the HR professionals here. So I, I look at uh, one recent one, Walmart's a customer. I think Doug McMillan is one of the best CEOs on the planet. It's, it's, I would say it's much easier for a company like Workday to start with a clean sheet of paper in 2005 and architect our business. Maybe in 30 years, that leader is going to try to undo all the things I screwed up. Uh, Doug McMillan comes into the biggest company in the world, and he's trying to affect cultural change. He's trying to embrace the employees in the stores and the distribution, uh, distribution areas, and he's using technology to do so. He, he wants to make the store a better environment for our customers, but also for the employees. He, he wants to make it uh, a place that, that is very clear they care about their employees. And I think at that scale, it's, it's, it's incredible. And, and HR is the way that he is, he is trying to enable that. And I, and I really think that that story is going to be a fascinating story to watch over the next few years. I, I think he's doing some of the best work. And, and his team of, of Jackie, Kenney, uh, Jackie Kenney and HR and, and Clay Johnson, who's their CIO, are doing some of the best work I've seen. You know, there's all the great tech companies, Amazon and Google and Facebook. They are great at this because they were born in the environment where it mattered. But if you've been around for a long time, it's, it's harder to make big cultural changes. So I'd say that's, that's one of the really good examples. But I would say that that's a great example that you can make change, even in a large, you know, 70-year-old company. And I think, if I remember correctly, earlier you mentioned some of your top customers. You mentioned FedEx, Walmart, and Amazon. Um, that sounds a little awkward, having <laughs> Amazon and Walmart being two of your top customers. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> are you, and are you that way when they try to get information out of, out oh, of, no. out of you about no, each other? You know, they, neither, neither minds. They're, they're, both trying to, they're, they're both trying to have the base, best HR environment. And, you know, what, what I've been surprised by, uh, we have a lot of the big retailers as customers, Target's a customer, Lowe's is a customer, Kohl's is a customer. On the HR side, they actually compare notes on how to get to best practices. That's not, yeah, yeah. No, they, want, they want to get to the best solutions they can, and in certain areas, they actually have really rich partnering conversations. That's really interesting. For the, the, you're, you're saying they, 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 can, they can't be altruistic about much but they can be about uh, agreeing that they want to do right by, by their yeah, people. And, and what they collectively want to do is to give us the right feedback huh? where the product goes. And if they're all aligned to say, hey, this is what we want from Workday for retailers, and they know if they act together, that it'll be a lot easier for us to act on. 
So I want to thank all of you for your attention and for stretching with us at the beginning of this session. And please join me in thanking Anil Bushri.